Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, I am Dr. Rose, Assistant Professor, Department of Anatomy, Government Medical College, Trishur. In this session, we will be dealing with the development happening during the third week of intrauterine period. So before moving on to the topic proper, let's see a case. This is known as caudal dysgenesis or sirenomelia. When you look at the fetus, you can see that the lower limbs are not properly formed and the lower limbs are fused and it looks like the tail of a mermaid. Hence, this is known as mermaid syndrome. So, the fusion of lower limbs resembles a mermaid's tail. So, in this session, we will be dealing with the changes happening during the third week of intrauterine period. So, when you go through the slides, in towards the end, you will get to know what is the basic anatomy behind the formation of mermaid's syndrome. So, in this session, we will be seeing the details or the changes happening in the germ disc under the following headings, gastrulation, the formation of primitive streak, the formation of notochord, the formation of allantoic diverticulum, the formation of procordial plate, the cloacal membrane, how is it formed and what is the fate of the cloacal membrane, pericardial bar. So, these are the changes which you expect in the germ disc. Simultaneously, the trophoblast also undergoes development. So, the changes in the trophoblast also will be dealt in the session. And towards the end, we will be seeing the applied aspects of this third week of intrauterine period. So, first we will see what do you mean by gastrulation. The term gastrulation means the formation of trilamina germ disc. So, till the end of second week, we have dealt with the formation of epiblast and hyperblast. So, what is happening during third week? So, the, by the process of gastrulation, the intraembryonic mesoderm comes in between the two germ layers and this is said to be a very highly sensitive stage for teratogenic insert. So, we should be very careful uh, when we administer some drugs or um, when the pregnant lady gets some infection, this is the stage of maximum teratogenic insult. So, this is the intraembryonic mesoderm formed between the ectoderm and endoderm. So, first let us see the changes happening to the germ disc. We have already discussed about the process of gastrulation. So, by the end of second week, we have a bilamina germ disc. So, by the process of gastrulation, this bilamina germ disc will be becoming an oval disc and this is now called trilamina germ disc by the formation of intraembryonic mesoderm. Now what happens is the trilamina germ disc will be before the formation of trilamina germ disc the, o, or the circular disc will be becoming an oval one and it will be roughly in the form of a pear with a broad cephalic end and a narrow caudal end. Now what happens is the bilaminar germ disc gets converted into trilaminar germ disc by the invagination of pluripotent cells from the epiblast. So, pluripotent cells are the cells which are cap capable of giving rise to any sort of cells. So, ultimately what happens is you get three germ layers. You have the epiblast here, you have the hypoblast here and in between you have the mesoderm formed from the epiblast. So, ultimately you have three germ layers, the epiblast which is known as the ectoderm in future, the hypoblast which is known as the endoderm and the intraembryonic mesoderm. So, once this is established, an axial orientation of the embryo is established. Now, we will see the details of epiblast. The epiblast is the one which you will be seeing, from, this is the view from above. When you remove the amniotic membrane and when you see from above, this will be the view of epiblast. So, the epiblast uh, will be differentiating into 
uh, layer known as surface ectoderm from which you have the formation of epidermis of skin. And towards the midline, you have the same epiblast getting modified as new rectodermal cells. So, new rectodermal cells will be giving rise to the formation of neural plate which is responsible for the central nervous system development. So, these are the uh, major events happening over the epiblast and finally, towards the caudal end you can see a primitive streak being formed. So, the primitive streak is actually seen at the caudal part of epiblast. So, this is the surface ectoderm this is the neurectoderm. Neurectoderm is actually seen towards the midline, surface ectoderm is actually seen towards the periphery and you have the primitive streak which is the uh, part of epiblast seen at the caudal part of the pear shaped embryonic disc. Now, let us see what is the, how is the primitive streak formed, what is the fate of the primitive streak. So, by the 15th day, the craniocaudal axis is established. Craniocaudal axis means till the end of second week you just have a circular disc. So, we would not be able to say which end will be forming the head of the embryo, which end will be forming the tail of the embryo or the caudal end of the embryo. We would not be in a position to say till the end of second week. But what happens during the third week is by the formation of this primitive streak it establishes a cephalocaudal axis. So, if you see the formation of primitive streak, yes, by then we, we can say that this is going to be the caudal end of the embryo and the opposite end is going to be the cranial end of the embryo. So, primitive streak is considered as the primary organizer. Why this is known as the primary organizer? Primary organizer means this is the structure which induces the formation of notochord and intraembryonic mesoderm. That is, after the formation of primitive streak, you get the formation of notochord and intraembryonic mesoderm. Or we can say that primitive streak is responsible for the formation of notochord and intraembryonic mesoderm. Now, let us concentrate on the primitive streak, the parts of the primitive streak and how this primitive streak is giving rise to the formation of notochord and intraembryonic mesoderm. So, let us have a look. This is said to be the cephalic end of the primitive streak, cephalic end. You can see that there is a slight elevation at the cephalic end. This elevation is known as primitive node or otherwise known as Henson's node. Now, there is a depression in the Henson's node. So, the depression in the Henson's node is known as primitive pit. So, at the cephalic end of the primitive streak, you get an elevation that is known as the Henson's node or primitive node and in the middle of the Henson's node, you have a depression that is known as primitive pit. Now, towards the caudal end of the disc, you can see a narrow groove in the primitive streak. This is known as primitive groove which is continuous with the primitive pit. So, these are the three major regions of the primitive streak. At the cephalic end, you have an elevation known as primitive node or Henson's node. In the middle of the Henson's node, you have a pit known as primitive pit and towards the caudal region along the primitive streak, you have a groove that is known as primitive groove. Now, uh, let us see how this uh, trilaminar germ disc is formed that is how the intraembryonic mesoderm is formed from the primitive streak. You can see that this is the caudal end and this is the cranial end of the disc. Now, if you take a vertical section and this is how you are going to view the disc from the side. So, from cranial end to caudal end you are going to cut the disc along a vertical line along the midline and you are removing one part and you are removing the other part from the side. So, this is the view. So, you can see a part of primitive streak here. This is the cranial end and this is the region which corresponds to the precordial plate and this is a caudal region which corresponds to cloacal membrane. This light blue colored region is known as the epiblast 
and this light yellow colored region is known as the hyperblast and you can see in between many fine red colored dots which are occupying the space between the epiblast and hyperblast. So these are the cells which are derived from the primitive streak. So you can see that the cells are actually derived from the primitive streak and they enter through the primitive pit and they occupy the region between the epiblast and hyperblast and that is how the intraembryonic mesoderm is formed. So the primitive streak you can see the migration of cells from the primitive streak and they occupy the space between the epiblast and hyperblast. So that is known as intraembryonic mesoderm. So the cells arising from the primitive streak, so this is actually a coronal section taken towards the caudal end. So this is the whole disc and towards the caudal end of the disc, if you are just taking a coronal session and looking from this aspect, from front, this is the view. So you can see a part of the primitive streak and you can see many pluripotent cells arising from the primitive streak and they are occupying the space between the epiblast and hypoblast. So the pluripotent cells from the ectoderm proliferate and occupy the space between the epiblast and hypoblast forming the intraembryonic mesoderm. So the process by which the bilamina germ disc is converted into trilamina germ disc is known as gastrulation. So this is how uh, the intraembryonic mesoderm is formed. Now what happens is the epiblast cells after forming or simultaneous to the formation of the intraembryonic mesoderm will be replacing the cells of the hypoblast. So what happens? The hypoblast will be renamed as definitive endoderm. Till this moment we were calling this layer as hypoblast but after the formation of the intraembryonic mesoderm some of the cells from the epiblast will be actually replacing the cells of the hypoblast. So from this point onwards the hypoblast is known as definitive endoderm. So this is how the hypoblast is getting converted into definitive endoderm and uh, the epiblast after the formation of intraembryonic mesoderm and definitive endoderm, now the epiblast is renamed as definitive ectoderm. So finally we have the ectoderm, the endoderm and the intraembryonic mesoderm derived from the pluripotent epiblast cells. So we can say that all the three germ layers, the ectoderm, the endoderm and the intraembryonic mesoderm are finally derived from the epiblast cells, the pluripotent epiblast cells. Now, what are the functions of primitive streak? We have already mentioned the formation of the intraembryonic mesoderm. So, first point will be it gives rise to the formation of intraembryonic mesoderm. Then it gives rise to the formation of notochord. In the midline, you can see a black uh, process extending from the primitive streak to the cephalic end up to the procordal plate. That is known as notochord. So, it also gives rise to the formation of notochord. And again towards the cranial end, a, a tissue known as septum transversum that is also being formed. After the formation of primitive streak, it establishes a craniocaudal axis for the embryo. And once this primitive streak is formed, we can just make a cut in the embryonic disc and say it is divided into right and left halves. So until the formation of primitive streak it will be just like a disc and we won't be able to divide it exactly into right and left halves. But once primitive streak is formed if we pass a line through the primitive streak that will divide the disc into right and left halves. So these are the functions of primitive streak. Now have you ever thought about the fate of primitive streak? What happens to the fate, uh, primitive streak once the notochord and the intraembryonic mesoderm is formed? So after fourth week of intrauterine period, the primitive streak gradually diminishes in size. It won't go all of a sudden, it gradually diminishes in size. Sometimes it may persist even after birth, sometimes it may persist and it is then known as or it is then seen as uh, sacrococcygeal teratoma. Sacrococcygeal teratoma is a big mass or a tumor like growth seen at the sacral region. So that is known as sacrococcygeal teratoma. So that is nothing but the remnant of primitive streak. And this is said to be the most common tumor during the neonatal period. Usually females are affected more compared to 
males and the ratio is said to be 4 is to 1. Now the teratoma can be either benign that is mature ones or malignant that is immature ones. So the immature ones will be composed of embryonic elements. So teratoma the word meaning is it contains tissues derived from all the three germ layers. The teratogens mainly affect the germ disc between the 15th and 18th day of intrauterine period. So as a result the primitive streak and notochord are affected the most compared to the rest of the structures. Now let us see the formation of notochord. The midline structure between the cranial end of the primitive streak and the caudal end of the precordal plate that is what is meant by notochord. So if you take a section of the disc and if you look at the mesodermal layer this is the ectodermal layer and this is the endodermal layer and if you check at the mesodermal layer you can see a rod like extension in the middle along the midline extending from this is the primitive streak right. So this is the cephalic end of the primitive streak. This is the precordal plate. So this is the caudal end of the precordal plate. So from the cephalic end of the primitive streak till the caudal end of the precordal plate a rod like extension along the midline in the mesoderm that is what is meant by notochord. So let us see the formation of notochord. Uh, uh, the discussion of formation of notochord can be dealt in steps that is first what happens is the cells in the primitive node region where is the primitive node here this is the cephalic end this is the caudal end you have the primitive streak here you have the primitive node here so the cells in the primitive node region proliferate and migrate cranially so this is a cranial direction this is cephalic end right so my the cells from this primitive node migrate cranially via the primitive pit so this is the primitive pit and it is through the primitive pit the cells gain access to the layer between the epiblast and hypoblast or the ectoderm and the endoderm. So they travel from the primitive node through the primitive pit along the midline from the primitive streak to the precordal plate. This is actually a median solid cellular cord in the beginning. So this cellular solid cord is known as notochordal process or head process. So this is the first stage of development of notochord. Now then what happens? So this is the first stage you can see a notochordal process or head process. This is actually the section taken through the midline and if you are looking from the side. When you are looking, uh, when you are, uh, looking at the disc in a different view that is a coronal session this is how it looks like. So if you make a cut here you can see the notochordal process as a dot. Okay. So this is what is meant by notochordal process or head process. Now what happens is the cavity of the primitive pit we just mentioned that the cells are entering into the space between the two through the primitive pit. So the cells actually enters through the primitive pit to form the notochordal process. Now what happens is the cavity of the primitive pit also extends into the process. So the solid cord is actually made into a canal. So this notochordal process is converted into a notochordal canal by the extension of the primitive pit into the notochordal process. So you can see a canal extending through the notochordal process. Now what happens is the notochordal canal actually fuses with the endoderm. The not, once the notochordal canal is formed it gradually descends down and this fuses with the endodermal layer. So when you look here you can see that the notochordal, notochordal canal actually fused with the endodermal layer and it forms openings in the floor of the notochordal canal. So what happened as a, as a result of this fusion? You can see a communication developed between the amniotic cavity above and the yolk sac below. Okay, so the communication is established between the amniotic cavity above and the yolk sac below. So this canal is known as neuroenteric canal 
new dendritic canal. So, first we had the notochordal process which is just a solid cord of cells. Since the primitive pit is extending into it, this solid cord of cells is actually uh, becoming converted into a canal. So, that is known as notochordal canal. Now, the canal descends down and fuses with the endodermal layer and later the floor just disappears so that a communication is made between the two major cavities the amniotic cavity and the yolk sac. So, this newly formed canal is known as neuroenteric canal. Have you ever wondered why this is named neuroenteric canal? Neuroenteric means this canal is actually established in order to nourish the neurectoderm on the ectodermal region. So, where is it coming from? The nourishment is coming from the yolk sac below. So, this is a part of the enteric system. So, this canal which helps to nourish the neurectoderm on the ectodermal plate is considered as the neuroenteric canal. So, this is a way to utilize the nourishment obtained from the yolk sac by the developing nervous system because till now uh, the placenta is yet to be developed. So, it needs nourishment till the placenta is fully formed. So, it will try to attain all sort of possible nourishments available from the uh, surrounding regions of the embryo. So, this is a way by which the neurectodermal cells will be getting its nourishment. So, the neuroendric canal will provide nourishment for the neurectodermal cells from the yolk sac. Now, once the nourishment is over, what happens? You need to seal off this canal you need to seal off this neuroenteric canal. So, now it is time for the canal to close. So, the walls of the canal will be now reformed. So, when you look at this stage, you can see that the walls of the canal is getting reformed and now you are just getting a plate. The communication is now lost and you are just getting a plate not known as the notochordal plate over the endodermal layer. There is no, com in this section you can see that there is no communication between the amniotic cavity and yolk sac and uh, you are just bridging the gap which was formed in the endoderm by a plate of cell known as notochordal plate. So, the notochord is not yet formed, we need notochord towards the end. So, what happens? The notochordal plate will actually escalate or ascend upwards and will be forming a tube that is known as definitive notochord and definitive notochord will be a solid rod of cells. So, the notochordal uh, cells will now detach from the endoderm and will be now lying in the midline in the intraembryonic mesoderm. So, that it is actually escalating from the endoderm that is the roof of the yolk sac above and it lies in the midline in the intraembryonic mesoderm. So, this is the notochordal plate which bridges the gap in the endoderm once the function of the neuroendric canal is over. Now, uh, you need notochord. So, what is happening is this notochordal plate is getting detached from the endodermal layer and it ascends upwards and forms a solid rod of cells and it lies in the midline in the intraembryonic mesoderm. So, we can see that uh, the endoderm is now continuous. You are not seeing any gap in the endoderm which was there when you uh, saw the development of the neuroendric canal. So, this gap is actually bridged and new endodermal cells are actually bridging the gap. Now, you can see the endoderm which is just as continuous as it was in the beginning. Now, what are the functions of notochord? The notochord helps to establish a central axis for the embryonic disc. So, this is the notochord and once the notochord is formed, it helps to establish a central axis for the embryonic disc. Once the notochord is formed, it will now induce the formation of neural tube. So, in embryology, it is always like that. When one structure is formed, after the completion of that structure, it will just go on and induce the formation of the other structure and this is actually a chain of processes. So, we had the primitive streak which was 
actually giving rise to the formation of notochord. Once the notochord is formed, the notochord will induce the formation of the neural tube and it just goes on. So, it provides a central column and it is around this central column we have the development of the vertebral bodies and intervertebral disc. So, let us see the fate of the notochord. So, uh, after the formation of the vertebral column, you do not need this notochord anymore, but still some part of the notochord which is trapped between the developing vertebral column will be seen in adults and some may persist as ligaments. So, what are the remnants of this notochord or what are the parts of the notochord which persist in adult after the formation of the notochord? One is known as nucleus pulposus. So, this is actually the intervertebral disc, the disc which is seen between the vertebrae. So, the intervertebral disc is made up of two parts. The outer circular part is known as annulus fibrosus and the in innermost part is known as nucleus pulposus. This nucleus pulposus is actually said to be the remnant of notochord. Another uh, remnant is known as apical ligament of dense. So, this is the atlas vertebra and this is the axis vertebra and this is the occipital bone. The atlas vertebra ha is not having a body, uh, but that is actually said to be the dense of axis. The detached portion of the body of atlas is actually getting fused with the axis and that is known as the dense or odontoid process of axis. So, when you trace the axis, you can see a ligament attached to the apex of the uh, dense of axis. So, that is known as the apical ligament of dense. So, along with the nucleus pulposus, apical ligament of dense is also considered as the remnant of notochord. Now, now another structure which is formed during this period is allantoic diverticulum. So, what do you mean by allantoic diverticulum? You have the endoderm. So, this yellow colored part is actually the endodermal derivatives. So, when you look at the endoderm, you can see a finger like projection. This is known as the endodermal diverticulum. And at which end you are seeing this endodermal diverticulum? This is the cephalic end, this is the caudal end. So, at the caudal end, you can see a diverticulum and that is known as the endodermal diverticulum. So, this is actually the yolk sac. So, it is actually the caudal end of the umbilical vesicle or yolk sac where you get the allantoic diverticulum. And you can expect the formation of the allantoic diverticulum by the 16th day of intrauterine period. And why you need this diverticulum? This diverticulum is actually projecting into the connecting stalk. And what is the role of this diverticulum? This is said to vascularize the chorion and the villi uh, and this ultimately results in the formation of umbilical blood vessels. So, the allantois or the allantoic diverticulum is a finger like projection arising from the caudal end of the endoderm that is the yolk sac and this actually projects into the connecting stalk whereby it helps to vascularize uh, the umbilical cord and it will ultimately result in the formation of the umbilical blood vessels. So, this is the allantoic diverticulum. Now, uh, the blood vessels of the allantoic stalk, you can see the blood vessels of the allantoic stalk, is, it is actually projecting into the umbilical stump, the umbilical cord and this will actually form the umbilical arteries. Now, in fetal life, after the formation of the umbilical arteries, you do not need this allantoic diverticulum, right? So, in the fetal life, after the formation of the umbilical blood vessels, this will be seen as a remnant that is known as uracus. So, the remnant of the allantoic diverticulum in fetal life, you call it as uracus, but again after birth, this uracus will be converted as median umbilical ligament that is the ligament lying in the midline that is known as median umbilical ligament there is only one ligament so it is known as median umbilical ligament so the allantois in the late fetal period the remnant is known as uracus and once the child is born 
this will be converted as median umbilical ligament. So, there are actually two remnants for the allantois. One is in the fetal period which you call it as uracus and one is in the adult period where you call it as the median umbilical ligament. The median umbilical ligament actually it extends, this is the future region of the urinary bladder. So, it extends from the apex of the urinary bladder up to the umbilical region in an adult. Now, uh, defects in the allantoic diverticulum, suppose if the allantoic diverticulum persists or if any sinus develops in the allantoic diverticulum or any cyst develops in this region, this will be usually associated with the abnormalities of the urinary bladder because the urinary bladder is actually connected to the allantoic diverticulum. So, let us have a quick look. This is said to be the distal end of the hindgut. You can see the allantois developing from the hindgut or this is otherwise known as cloaca and uh, this cloaca or the hindgut is actually divided into two parts by a septum that is known as urorectal septum. So, the urorectal septum is going to split the cloaca into two parts, one anterior portion to which you have the attachment of the allantoic diverticulum and the posterior segment. What do you call the posterior segment? Posterior segment is actually in continuation with the gut. So, that is the primitive rectum and the anterior segment is known as primitive urogenital sinus. So, the entire cloaca is divided by the formation of urorectal septum into a posterior primitive rectum and an anterior primitive urogenital sinus. So, what is formed from the primitive rectum? It is the rectum and anal canal. So, rectum and anal canal are formed from the primitive rectum whereas, the primitive urogenital sinus is giving rise to the bladder. So, we, you can see that the allantois is actually attached to bladder. So, in the adults, if you look at the bladder, the remnant of the allantois will be seen in the form of median umbilical ligament. Now, apart from these regions, there are some other regions which are developed in the uh, embryonic disc. That is, the ectoderm and endoderm remain in contact at certain regions without the formation of intraembryonic mesoderm in between. So, one such place is known as precordal plate. So, that is a small circular area in the cephalic end where you get the endodermal cells as columnar cells. Usually, the endodermal cells are cuboidal, but at the cephalic region in the precordal plate, if you look at the endodermal cells, the endodermal cells will be columnar in nature. Another peculiarity of this precordial plate is when we, when we discussed about the formation of intraembryonic mesoderm, uh, the cells from the primitive streak are just going in between the epiblast and hypoblast and it will just go cranially and caudally and will occupy the space between the epiblast and hypoblast except at these two major regions at the precordial plate and the cloacal region. In these two plates, it uh, they are not able to invaginate between the epiblast and hypoblast. So, at the precordial plate and at the cloacal region, these two layers, which are the two layers, the epiblast and hypoblast will remain close to each other. You can see that the epiblast and hypoblast remain close to each other without the intervening intraembryonic mesoderm. That is known as precordial plate. And this uh, plate is actually giving rise to the formation of oropharyngeal membrane. Oropharyngeal membrane is actually this formed, as, formed in this region and if there is any rupture, not if there is any, it should rupture in order to make a communication between the oral cavity and the primitive gut tube. So, this is the precordal plate. Now, similar to the cranial region, you have at the caudal region, uh, a region known as cloacal membrane it is actually, this is a primitive streak. So, this cloacal membrane is actually lying caudal to the primitive streak. So, the cloacal membrane is actually further divided into two, that is the anal membrane and urogenital membrane by the urorectal septum. Urorectal septum was the septum which was dividing the cloaca into primitive urogenital sinus and the primitive rectum. We just discussed it. So, the urorectal septum will come down and it will uh, reach up to the cloacal membrane where it splits the cloacal membrane into anal membrane and urogenital membrane. Now, along the notochord also, along the formation of, no, along the midline, 
we have the formation of notochord. So, along the formation of notochord also, uh, you won't be getting any intraembryonic mesoderm. So, these are some of the regions apart from the primitive streak, uh, the surface heterodom and neurotodom, which you get in the embryonic disc. One more region I would like to mention is the pericardial bar. Pericardial bar is again an inverted U shaped intraembryonic mesoderm cranial to the buccopharyngeal membrane. So, this is actually seen in the uh, mesodermal layer that is the mesoderm as it goes between the epiblast and hypoblast when it reaches the precordial plate it is not able to invaginate between the layers of the precordial plate. So, it will just go cranially and it will just wind around and it will just form an inverted U shaped loop. So, this bar is known as pericardial bar. Now, these are the events which are occurring at the germ disc. Now, let us see what are the changes happening in the trophoblast. So, this is the trophoblast. We have the inner cytotrophoblast and we have the outer syncytial trophoblast. So, we can see the syncytial trophoblast between these are the lacuna spaces, right? So, the syncytial trophoblast lying between the lacuna spaces, they are known as the trabeculae, the blue colored region lying between the lacuna spaces. These are the lacuna spaces which are later invaded by the endometrial arteries and endometrial veins. So, the space between these sp uh, lacunar spaces, uh, you get the syncytial trophoblast and this part is actually known as trabeculae. By the second week, you have the formation of primary chorionic villi. That means, the cytotrophoblast will be actually extending towards the syncytial trophoblast as finger like extensions. Uh, this is known as the for formation of primary chorionic villi. This happens by the end of second week of intrauterine period. Now, what happens is you need to convert this primary villi into secondary villi and tertiary villi. So, the primary villi, the formation of primary villi is said to be the first stage in the development of chorionic villi of the placenta. Now, let us see what is happening to the primary chorionic villi. So, this is the syncytial trophoblast. If you just take, this is a schematic representation of a chorionic villi. So, this is the syncytial trophoblast and inner to it, we have just discussed that uh, the cytotrophoblast is extending into the syncytial trophoblast as finger like extensions. So, outer syncytial trophoblast and an inner cytotrophoblast. So, this finger like extension is known as primary villus. Now, what happens is you have the extra embryonic mesoderm lying just beneath it. So, into this villus, you can see the extension of the extra embryonic mesoderm. This is the extra embryonic mesoderm. So, this is known as secondary villus. So, the primary villus with the invagination of extra embryonic mesoderm is known as secondary villus. Now, into this mesoderm, you have the blood vessels form entering the fetal capillaries. So, the fetal capillaries invade the mesoderm of the secondary villus to form the tertiary villus. So, these are the three stages of villi and all these three stages will be completed by the end of third week of intrauterine period. So, primary villus which was the first stage was actually formed by the end of second week. Now, that is converted into secondary villus by the formation of extraembryonic mesoderm and when the fetal capillaries invade the extraembryonic mesoderm, you call this as tertiary villus. And each tertiary villus possess, if you look at the center and if you look towards the periphery, you can see the different layers as first one, it will be the endothelial cells of the chorionic capillaries. Now, outer to that, you, outer to that, you can see the primary mesoderm. Then again, outer to it, you can see the cytotrophoblast and outermost will be the syncytial trophoblast. So, these are the different layers uh, when you look from center to periphery at a tertiary villus. So, the endothelial cells of the coronary capillaries, then you have the primary mesoderm, then you have the cytotrophoblast followed by the syncytial trophoblast. Now, as the trophoblast is getting converted into villi, 
uh, with the formation of villi, the lacuna spaces will be the spaces which are lying between the villi. So, this uh, lacuna space is renamed as intervillous space. So, the same lacuna space uh, which is lying between the villi, you call it as intervillous space since it is lying between the villi. And this intervillous space will be actually invaded by the maternal blood. And the branching villi will be the villi which is projecting into the lacuna spaces. So, these are the villi and uh, you will be getting the space between the villi. So, this is the space between the villi. This is known as intervillous space. So, the intervillous space is actually the lacuna space. So, the lacuna space after the formation of the villi, you rename it as intervillous space. Now, uh, this is the maternal side and this is the fetal side. You can see that the cytotrophoblast is invading through the syncytiotrophoblast in order to reach the outer aspect. So, when it reaches the outer aspect, it will actually coalesce with the cytotrophoblast of the neighboring villi also. Okay. So, the cytotrophoblast from the fetal side will go through the syncytiotrophoblast and it will reach the outer aspect. When it reaches the outer aspect, it will actually coalesce with the cells of or the other cytotrophoblastic cells and ultimately what happens is you will get another cytotrophoblastic shell formed that is known as outer cytotrophoblastic shell. But the mesodermal cells, you can uh, see the mesodermal cells invaginating into the villi, you can see the fetal capillaries invaginating into the villi. So, these structures will not be able to reach outside the cytotrophoblastic shell. So, the cytotrophoblastic shell or the outer shell will actually prevent the uh, entry of the mesoderm as well as the fetal capillaries beyond this level into the endometrial region. So, that is the function of the outer cytotrophoblastic shell. So, let us see the applied aspects. Uh, this was the opening statement, the caudal dysgenesis or sirenomelia. This is otherwise known as mermaid syndrome because the fusion of the lower limbs which uh, uh, actually resembles a mermaid's tail. That is why this is known as, this condition is known as mermaid syndrome. And have you ever thought what is the reason for this? Uh, we have already mentioned about gastrulation, the process of gastrulation where you get the mesoderm in between the ectoderm and endoderm. But in this condition, the mesoderm is not properly formed in the caudal region of the embryo. So, what happens is in the caudal region, you will not be getting a proper formation of lower limbs, the urogenital system and vertebra in the lumbosacral region. So, all these uh, structures will be affected if the gastrulation is not occurring properly in the caudal region of the embryo and that will result in caudal dysgenesis or sirenomelia. So, to summarize, in this session, we discussed about the changes happening in the germ disc as well as the changes happening in the trophoblast. The changes happening in the germ disc we discussed under the following headings. What do you mean by gastrulation? How a primitive streak is formed? How are the cells coming from the primitive streak resulting in the formation of the intraembryonic mesoderm, the notochord? Uh, now, how the allantoic diverticulum is formed, what is the fate of the allantoic diverticulum, what do you mean by precordial plate, what do you mean by cloacal membrane and what do you mean by pericardial bar, all these things are the changes which you expect in the germ disc during the third week of intrauterine period. We also discussed about the uh, changes happening for the trophoblast that is by the end of third week, uh, we have uh, the tertiary villi formed chorionic villi, tertiary villi is one because by the end of second week we had only primary villi. It was actually undergoing a process of development whereby by the end of third week we are having a tertiary villi, tertiary chorionic villi. So, all these are the changes which we can expect in the third week of intrauterine life. Thank you.